All right, uh, my name is Robbie Hamlet. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Teal. Uh, this is a presentation I'm doing uh, about new services that are enabled by eSIM technology. It's uh, gonna be on-site at IoT Tech Expo, but I guess this is for everyone that is not able to physically attend. Um, so here's today's agenda. Uh, we're gonna start about uh, some challenges, start with some challenges uh, about solutions that don't use eSIM. Um, some uh, definitions on eSIM 101. Uh, the benefits of true eSIM, we're gonna talk about uh, what it can do uh, as far as opening up new services and then get into some actual use cases. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, some of the more leading edge stuff, we're gonna talk about um, the interoperability uh, between uh, new network profiles and uh, eSIM technology. So, uh, so there's some common challenges. Uh, for those that don't use eSIM technology. Uh, the biggest one uh, is poor availability and roaming restrictions. So um, you might have difficulties if you're deploying multiple cellular networks if you're not actually using an eSIM, um, because if you're trying to access more than one network on a device, you might be loading it up with you know, three or four SIM cards. Uh, it might be very difficult even just to get the right SIM card in a lot of cases. Um, where uh, networks become use case specific or feature specific, um, those can be kind of their own uh, skew, even within a carrier perspective. And then there's time and money loss uh, managing multiple SKUs and multiple connectivity agreements. With eSIM technology, uh, you can consolidate all of the um, technology into one SKU, all the different networks into one SKU, and eliminate uh, truck rolls and SIM swaps that you might be doing today. Um, and then redundancy if you're using a, a regular plastic SIM card. Uh, it's not going to access more than one network that it's been pre-assigned with. So um, those are just some of the common challenges people have with, with uh, traditional SIM solutions. Now, a brief history of eSIM technology. So um, the form factor was defined uh, as like QFNA, SONA, uh, QFDNA, uh, MFF2, these are all like a lot of acronyms, but uh, the chip, the actual like package, was defined a little bit before 2016, um, but it didn't have any real programmable functionality. So in 2016, uh, the GSMA released the M2M -M spec called SGP02. Um, this enables programmability at scale, so um, if you have one of those chips, you can actually change something in it. Then they said, I think there's a market for this with phones and, uh, and tablets and consumer devices. So the consumer spec was released in 2017. Um, in 2022, Teal launched uh, its certified platform um, to defragment. Uh, you know, we had we had six years of people trying to run out eSIM solutions, but nobody really solving for the complexity of scale uh, that enterprise have. And in 2022, the GSMA said this eSIM thing might just be catching on, uh, and uh, the iPhone, uh, the Apple, <laughs> the Apple, Apple agreed and uh, made their uh, iPhone eSIM only. So uh, the future is certainly bright for for eSIM. Um, but what is an eSIM? Um, it's really confusing sometimes whether we're talking about the form factor of an embedded SIM or the functionality of a programmable component. Um, Companies like Teal were offering eSIM in both plastic and embedded form factors. Uh, and what that means is you can change the identity uh, over time. So um, it can be plugged into a device like a router or embedded onto an OEM board and you're always able to activate different network services um, and uh, easily connect your devices to, to evolving needs. So uh, there's kind of four um, fundamental requirements that are driving eSIM adoption today. So the first is uh, redundancy. So uh, if you're shipping a, a product with just one SIM card in it and it's got one identity, it's not gonna have any backup functionality. You're not gonna have an ability to go uh, and change things out later. Uh, you're having a single point of failure. So eSIM eliminates that with its dynamic uh, programmability. Availability and performance. This is uh, something that I'm gonna really talk a lot about when it comes to these new services. It's one of the things that's most important to them. Uh, it's just the fact that uh, if you were doing multi-network in the past, you were probably using some amount of roaming. Uh, eSIM allows for low latency, high bandwidth networks to be deployed uh, anywhere in the world. So if you're using uh, a device 
uh, and you want to have the best network possible for any given time or the best uh, configuration possible as we look at some of these use cases, um, you don't have to build a specific SKU for that. You don't have to go out and get your own SIM card for that. Uh, it can all be handled with OTA, which is in the point number three here, which probably provides the best dollar return on investment for eSIM, which is product simplification. So um, no longer do you have to have stock a separate SKU for each market that you're going into. Um, a real eSIM solution is gonna make it so you can build one product and ship it anywhere in the world. Um, and you're gonna have this fourth point here, control and flexibility. So um, it's your say as the enterprise using the eSIM technology as to what networks it goes on. And um, later on, I'll talk about the different approaches to eSIM um, that some of um, some other solutions might employ and why you should be wary of like an eSIM from an operator versus an eSIM from um, an actual SIM technology vendor. But um, the meat of today's uh, presentation or the, the, the real topic here is what new services are being enabled with eSIM. So the first one, uh, is robots. Um, this is something that uh, kind of synergizes well with, with eSIM technology because robotics uh, in many cases like Starship where we have a great case study on our website, um, they're requiring that low latency, um, high bandwidth access to, to networks um, where they couldn't roam on just any network. They couldn't just take the radio network of AT&T and you know, one aggregate data center. They need the full functionality of, of uh, the different MNO networks that they want to access. So they also have a bunch of different sites. So uh, in Starship's example, they deploy their robots uh, on college campuses for food delivery and snack delivery and uh, maybe homework delivery. I don't know if they've, uh, they've really figured that model out yet as far as homework delivery, but um, these, uh, these campuses can be in rural environments or metro environments, uh, obviously very different network topographies and uh, with eSIM, they can stay flexible about uh, always getting the best performing network for that specific area. So um, the next thing up is uh, something that is pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so BB loss drone, so uh, beyond visual line of sight is what BB loss stands for. Um, it means that the uh, equipment is gonna be going further than not only can they reach physically, but they can even see. Uh, so that means it's going to be remotely piloted. A lot of uh, drones are still piloted kind of by eyeballing where it is in the air and using the uh, joysticks to change it. Um, in BB loss, there's no option to visually position the uh, equipment. You need to be relying on the sensors in the equipment to, to change where it's going um, or to control it. And um, for that reason, there's a high uh, dependability, there's a high um, dependability on uh, upstream, so the networks are actually configured a little bit differently for BB loss drones, where um, uplink speed is, is very much a hard requirement, uh, more so than downlink uh, is getting the data up back to the device as far as uh, where it should be going. Um, but it also changes the spectrum allocated because you have uh, regulators in certain cities that say you can't use these bands uh, in the air above you know 10,000 feet or 5,000 feet or whatever. You can only use this chunk of spectrum, and that means the carriers have to change their configurations. And as a, an enterprise, you'd have to change out the SIM card. But eSIM um, means that they can deploy kind of one thing, and one city's uh, spectrum requirements can be met with uh, just one product, and another city's uh, spectrum requirements can be met with that exact same product. So more dynamic means more different uh, network use cases can be, be deployed. Uh, the second to last thing we have here is the mission critical applications. This is where redundancy really um, plays in. So you have use cases like uh, logistics, where you have um, people that are looking at um, like the inflationary crisis we've had of getting products to people. Um, if you guys remember back in COVID, there was this uh, supply chain issue. Um, digitizing the supply chain uh, really helps um, make the economy go faster. Uh, because you have more data about where everything's going and you wouldn't want to just rely on a single network provider in order to do that sort of thing. Likewise with medical, I mean, you might be sending a, a heart to a transplant uh, provider um, or transplant office and uh, you wouldn't want to rely on a single uh, solution for that. 
Same thing with wildfires. Um, actually, sometimes the towers can burn down and you would want to, especially when they're disguised as, as uh, uh, trees, as you guys might have seen out in the wild. Um, if things are on fire, you definitely want to have a backup. Um, and then agriculture, one really interesting thing that happens with agriculture is uh, you can design a network, you can design a, a deployment of devices when the crop is low in the ground and not growing yet. And then uh, by the fall, when it's time to harvest, the growth has made it so your soil monitoring sensors can't actually connect to the tower that's going in that direction, but maybe they can connect the other direction where they're unblocked by um, harvest equipment or the even even the foliage itself. So um, again, all things where eSIM really opens up this, um, this ability to be dynamic and redundant in its um, capability. So another great case study was Safely. Um, they're doing buses that uh, deliver uh, school children and uh, in the past uh, because of transport requirements because of how difficult it is to work uh, with certain operators they were only able to do things like uh, GPS addressing uh, now that they have easy access to um, low uh, latency high bandwidth uh, data networks with eSIM um, they can do things like uh, real-time video monitoring, um, real-time communications. Uh, they're not yet making the buses, you know, autonomous driving themselves. I think there's a little bit of work to make it actually that safe. But um, in terms of just uh, watching, keeping eyes on the school children, uh, eSIM has enabled them to use more data because they're getting access to better networks all through one solution. Uh, and those requirements are changing over time. So. Um, this is uh, something leading edge, there's not even really a, a graphic for it, um, but multi-mode networks. So this is uh, when a device is using uh, cellular and satellite at the same time. And um, eSIM is starting to be a part of this conversation because satellite uh, with 3GPP release 17 is adopting the same authentication methods as other licensed spectrum technologies again, such as cellular. Um, so SIM cards are becoming compatible with satellite networks. So if you look at MBIOT from space or um, even some of the higher payload uh, satellite applications in multi-mode or even a hybrid network, um, you could see eSIM technology um, making it easier to access those um, non-terrestrial uh, cellular type networks. So um, <clears throat> it's really important uh, when you think about uh, really, really remote devices that are outside. A lot of those use cases I just went through, eSIM is a big benefit because um, you're optimizing the network configuration for where the device is at a certain time. Um, and that's like, you know, the network in Oklahoma is probably better uh, than the network in Vermont uh, on a specific carrier. And you might want to use different carriers in different markets. With satellite, um, you know, what are you going to do when you go to Alaska or you go to Antarctica? you can actually do a global deployment and you can mix the, the cost effectiveness of a terrestrial network with the um, coverage ability of a non-terrestrial network. So your devices stay uh, always connected. So um, Teal itself is completely technology neutral. So um, what we're building is an ecosystem of interoperable machine data networks. So that's focusing on the authentication mechanism themselves those network credentials, how do we load as many of those into one cloud-driven platform as possible and then make them accessible to as many people as possible. So networks should be as accessible to solution providers as applications. We, we think of these things like an app store with each network being its own app and even different solutions within that network. Like I talked about, you might see um, like a T-Mobile offering that has just 5G and then a T-Mobile offering specific for a drone application or a T-Mobile offering uh, specific for a, um, a mobile edge compute or mobile equipment compute uh, system. With, with Teal, I mean, we, we work with all the MNOs uh, in the US, so we have those different uh, subscriptions available, um, but the network should also be given the tools to deploy these types of solutions. Thinking about the opposite problem if you're a network and you're designing um, a drone specific network, you really want people to try to find the SIM card on your website that is definitely not getting loaded on your website anytime soon, or do you want it to be you know, a button press or an API call through an app store like Teal? 
So I keep talking about this app store concept. Uh, and you guys have probably, if you're attending this, heard about eSIM before. Um, but where Teal really differentiates is that we're a first party provider of technology. So if you go on the GSMA website, you'll see us. If you go on the GSMA website and you look for an MBNO or an MNO, you won't find their names there because they didn't build the technology. What that means is that they're building and deploying eSIM uh, just to point you back into their network. So it's not really a neutral solution. We work with different uh, chip manufacturers. Um, we let the operators route the data themselves. We don't uh, have like a like an MBNO approach where we're, we are running our own mobile core and pointing you through that. You're really getting that carrier when you access it through Teal, because it, like I said, it's really like an app. That's the whole direct network enrollment component. It's not our credential, it's not our, our, our ICC ID. It belongs to that network and it's about distributing that into the equipment. Um, and then uh, we're also able to uh, scale because we own the technology. If you have a network requirement, we had a customer that needed uh, NTT Docomo, so we were able to onboard that for them without any cost uh, to, that, to that enterprise because we're building this uh, cloud-based ecosystem, this, this app store. So um, one of our final slides here, um, we're putting you in programmatic control. So every device that ships with an eSIM should be future-proof, it should be global, and it should be able to be cost-effective. And with Teal, the model that we've built is all three of those things. So um, it's a constantly evolving system, so it's always future-proof. Today, people aren't even worrying about the transition from 5G non-standalone to 5G standalone and what that means for their equipment. Um, building with an eSIM technology means you don't have to worry about the next version of 3G sunsets um, or, or the next outage that a regional operator has. Um, and then global, you know, we're in 3,500 different networks, 196 countries, we can reach basically anywhere in the world. Um, and then industry leading, you know, because we're working directly with carriers, um, this is carrier direct pricing, which is always going to be the best uh, pricing compared to a middleman um, like an MBNO would operate. So um, it's the freedom to choose what networks your IoT devices connect to. Um, obviously, with all the use cases I went through today, um, uh, all of them were able to uh, be deployed and evolve because they had this uh, dynamic component to them. So um, eSIM unlocked new use cases. And uh, if you're interested in uh, talking about your use case or um, solving a problem, we love solving problems. Um, if you have something really specific, like I need to use this chunk of spectrum in this city, um, we'd love to talk about that. So um, thank you all for uh, for coming out today, especially those attending virtually, which I guess nobody in, in person is gonna see this <laughs> recording, but uh, 